You are listening to The Overwhelmed Brain. Today's episode is brought to you by Audible. Go to audible.com forward slash brain to start your 30-day trial now. That's A-U-D-I-B-L-E dot com forward slash brain or text the word brain to 500-500. Are you annoyed by affirmations? Are you tired of that same old rehashed personal growth advice that all seems to boil down to think positively and all your problems will go away? If affirmations feel like lies and positive thinking feels like denial, then I want you to get ready. The Overwhelmed Brain is here to help you create the life you want now. Hello and welcome to The Overwhelmed Brain. I am your host, Paul Coliani, personal empowerment coach, and I'm here to help you increase your emotional intelligence, strengthen your self-worth and self-esteem, and empower you so that you can make decisions that are right for you. Everything I talk about on this show is my personal opinion and is meant for information on educational purposes only. Always consult a medical professional before making any changes to your medical treatment. All right, the first thing I want to talk about is something to do with permanence versus impermanence. And as you know, we are in a world of change. Everything is changing, or at least some things are changing. Maybe that toxic relationship you have isn't changing. Maybe the um, job that you don't like isn't changing. Maybe there are things in your life that don't change. But uh, the question is, why aren't they changing? Is it because of circumstances beyond your control? Or do you have control? Do you have decision-making ability and choose not to decide or choose not to take action? Because there are many things in life that we have a choice in and we choose not to choose. There are times in my marriage when I was married that I felt like I had no choice because I was committed. I made a promise. I made a commitment And now I have no choice. Now, on one hand, that can be very beneficial. When you commit and you have no choice, then you find ways to work out whatever the problems are. You do your best to work things out. Uh, You exhaust all your resources trying to work things out. So when there's a problem in something you commit to, you go the distance trying to fix it because you've made that commitment. You are a person of your word and you want to follow through and make sure that people see you You are of integrity, that you are honest. Or just because you might feel bad in yourself if you break your own word. So I think in some ways commitment and a sense of permanence is a good thing. It can compel us to do the right thing, to do the thing that's needed so that we learn, heal, grow, and evolve and get to a better space everywhere in our life, or at least in the places that are having issues. But it can also be a detriment because when things are going bad and they're not getting any better and we, do, and we do exhaust all of our resources trying to fix it and we stay in the situation, that's when that dreaded sense of permanence uh, doesn't really benefit us anymore. It doesn't feel good at all. It is that sense of forever. Like, I'll never get out of this. It's that sense of I have no control. I have no way to uh, escape from this challenge, from these problems. And so this is something that comes up for us in all aspects of life. Everywhere you look can be a sense of permanence. It's just like um, eating and breathing. You always have to eat and breathe. It's just the way it is. That is a permanent, immutable thing that's always necessary in your life, unless they come up with something new that (laughs) science figures out. Uh, But for now, that's what it is. We have to eat and breathe. And uh, water is definitely in that mix. So we need water as well. Um, So those feel like, okay, they're going to, they're going to be permanent in our lives. And uh, we come to a level of acceptance with permanence. When we know there's nothing we can do about it, there's nothing we can change about something Uh, In order to continue going through this life with any sense of uh, feeling okay, at least, we have to come to a level of acceptance of what's permanent. So when you think about your life, what are the things that are permanent versus what are the things that 
you could change if you wanted to. Because if you have something going on in your life that is permanent, at least the way you see it, and you believe you have no choice, let's just say that you did have a choice. Let's look at food and water, for example. You do have a choice. You could choose not to eat food and not to drink water. The consequence of that choice would probably be fatal. But you do have a choice. So there's a taste of how my brain works. <laughs> and uh, the reason I say that is because we go through life thinking we have no choice. But really, do we honestly have no choice? Now, that was an extreme example. I don't want you to stop eating or stop drinking water. I want you to just consider the choices that you make on a daily basis. For example, choosing to do something that you don't want to do, uh, yet you still do it because you believe you have no choice. Uh, you're in a job that you hate. You keep going to it every day or at least the days that you're working. And uh, you believe you have no choice because if you stop working at this job, you won't have uh, medical insurance. You won't have any money to buy food. Uh, you won't have uh, money to pay the rent or pay your mortgage or pay your utilities. I mean, there's all kinds of things to do with money there. And if you quit, you're, you'd lose that source of income. And then you'd think, wow, if I quit, I mean, this is what I look at when I drill down into um, challenges in our life. When I quit, that means I'll have no money. If I have no money, that means I'll have no food and shelter. If I have no food and shelter, I'll end up on the street. And, you know, what, what else stems from that? I'll be alone. Nobody will want to be with me. I'll um, be homeless and I won't be able to uh, get warm and stay sheltered and I won't be able to eat. And if I can't eat, then I'll starve, I'll suffer and I'll have to, I don't know, maybe I'll die. That's drilling down into the, the problem. So when it comes to like uh, going to work, uh, doing something that you hate just to make an income, the root of the issue isn't necessarily at the surface level of, hey, I need to make an income, so I better go to work. It really boils down to, to survival. I mean, you may know this already, but the idea of um, feeling like you could actually die if you don't go to work. I mean, it's that deep. You may not experience this consciously, but unconsciously you're carrying this um, program around that if I don't work, I will die. We don't normally say that. I, you know, when I used to look for work and I was, and I feared losing my job, I would show up and accommodate everyone and make sure that I was people pleasing everyone I met at work so that I wouldn't lose my job. Uh, even though there were a lot of aspects of my job I didn't like, but I never spoke up about those aspects because I didn't want to upset anyone because if I upset anyone, that it might the word might get around and it might get to my manager and then I might lose my job. But why was I afraid? Well, at the surface level, I was afraid because I, would, I wouldn't have any more money. That money thing, oh, it's more money, more money. And then I asked myself questions like, well, why is it bad to not have money? And of course, the answer to that is, well, that's a stupid question. I mean, that's what I say to myself. That's a stupid question. But I ask myself stupid questions all the time. So I went with it. And I go, well, if I didn't have any money, I wouldn't be able to pay my rent. Okay, how is that a bad thing? What? That's a stupid question. Well, let's ask the stupid questions and see where we go with it. Well, if I can't pay my rent, well, then I'll have no place to live. And then I'll ask myself, really? You will have no place to live? You can't live anywhere? You'll just uh, live on the street or something? And at first I want to go, yeah, I won't be able to pay rent. Really? You won't be able to live with uh, someone else? Uh, you won't be able to crash on someone's couch? And they'd be like, yeah, but I don't want to do that. I don't want to be that kind of person that goes crashes on my friend or family's couch. Then the thought of, oh, so you do have a choice. You just don't want to make that choice. Well, yeah, but that's stupid. Again, <laughs> stupid questions, stupid answers, stupid whatever. I'm going to go down this road and see where it takes me because I was, I'm so stuck at the surface level. I mean, that's what happens with us. We're so stuck at these surface level things like, I don't want to quit because it pays me. Okay, let's talk about that. Why is money important? Why is money important? You know, ask yourself these stupid questions. Find out where they go and continue drilling down into 
these challenges that you have in your life. Uh, for example, you're in a relationship and um, you have a couple kids and your spouse is mistreating you or being abusive or really being mean. And you're like, you know, I wish I didn't have this relationship or I wish my spouse would treat me nicely. I'm doing everything nice and he or she's not doing anything nice. They're just being mean. So the question might come up, well, gee, I can't get a divorce because I promised that I would stay married and go through this better or worse thing and through the thick and thin trying to work on this relationship to make it better. Yeah, but my spouse isn't doing anything to make it better. It's only me. But I've committed, so I'm going to stay in something I don't like because I've committed and it's more important to keep your commitments than to be happy. Uh, what? <laughs> that's what might happen, these thoughts that come to your mind when you think these things through. Wait, that's not right. I mean, why commit if I'm not happy, especially in a relationship? You might have that kind of thought process. But let's go through the drill down. Okay, let's just say that, um, okay, we've seen a therapist and it's not working. And uh, I've tried every self-help thing in the book and it's not working. I've reached out to friends and family. I've talked with my husband or my wife. I've done everything I possibly could. I've honored myself. You know, you try all these things until you're exhausted and you go, I've tried everything. So what's next? I don't want to stay in a relationship that uh, this person mistreats me all the time. Uh, he or she is a bad influence or he or she hurts me and, and emotionally, hopefully not physically, but uh, emotional hurt can be just as painful and last just as long, if not longer. So there's all kinds of um, uh, reasons to get out of this relationship, yet I've committed. So what do we do with these commitments? Well, uh, I like to, like I said, drill down. Let's just say that I believe I have no choice. I'm stuck. I can't leave. I don't have control of the finances. He or she has uh, control of everything. So what do I do about that? Well, what you do is ask yourself questions. Okay, let's just say that I did uh, separate for a while. Where would I go? I don't know. Well, where would I go? Let's just say that he or she separated from me or he or she kicked me out. What do I do then? Now I'm kicked out. Now you're forcing your brain to work a little differently within different limitations. You're actually breaking through your previous limited thinking. And that's vital because where you were before the process is you're in a space of, well, I can't leave. I can't leave because I can't go anywhere and I don't have any money. Okay, but if I force this scenario upon you, guess what? You're going to figure something out. So what happens is your partner uh, wants to break up and they kick you out of the house. It may not be right. It may not be good. It may not be healthy for anyone, uh, the kids or whatever. Uh, but this is what's happening. Now you're kicked out. Now you're maybe sitting in your car and you don't know what to do and you're crying. I don't know. But what would you do? What would you do in that scenario? Because what you come up with is exactly what you can come up with when you believe you have no choice. Now, I might be wrong about some people that are listening right now. They may go outside and they don't have a car. And now they have to walk for miles to the nearest payphone or who knows. There might be different scenarios. Yet there, there's still a path to follow, even though we don't know the destination. Because when the scenario unfolds for us, when it happens to us, we tend to come up with a solution, even if it's a terrible one. But at least it's something. At least it's a place to sleep for the next night or a place to think for the next night. Even if you end up at the airport and stay there all night while you think things through, there's usually something that happens that gets you to a point where a thought comes to mind that wasn't there before. And it wasn't there before because you never expanded it enough to accommodate scenarios that just seemed unlikely. Like you could never picture yourself leaving this relationship or leaving this job. So your brain would never go there and visit those scenarios. But what if? What if your job fired you tomorrow or today, sent you home early? What would you do? I don't know what I would do. Well, walk through it. Imagine yourself in that scenario. Okay, um, I'd still have a paycheck coming to me, so I know that would be there. And 
Uh, I would probably start looking for work. I would call my friends. I would post it on Facebook. I would say, you know, I don't have work anymore and this is, you know, devastating. I don't know what to do. And then I don't know what I would do from there. Okay, let's just say that the worst case scenario unfolded. You don't have work and you don't get it for days or weeks or months. What's going on in your life? Where are you? What's happening? And actually explore these scenarios as unpleasant as some of them may be just to find out if any thoughts come to mind that weren't there before. That's an interesting place to go, and it really helps you uh, expand where you are when you think you're stuck in something permanent. Now, I have a viewpoint that uh, really takes into account that nothing is permanent. And that sounds kind of defeating at first because, oh, no, you're in a great relationship and you're saying it's not permanent? You have no idea how liberating it is to the brain to realize that nothing is permanent. Um, I'm not saying that this is a healthy belief. (laughs) I'm not saying it's a healthy one for you to have. But for me, it, it works amazingly well to step into something and go, you know what? What I'm doing here, I want it to last until I'm too old to do it anymore. What I'm doing today, who I'm with today, I want it to last. But can I honestly say this is it? This is permanent. I'm committed and there's not going to be any changes ever because throughout my life, I don't think I have a single reference that anything that I've gone out to accomplish is per- is permanent. Every job I've had, every relationship I've had, nothing seems permanent. I'm not saying that the universe doesn't have some sense of permanence to it, but even thinking about how much oxygen we have to breathe, I mean, again, it sounds defeating, but someday this planet, billions of years from now, won't have enough oxygen and will probably burn up, according to what the scientists say. But, you know, that kind of change is very far away. But how I look at permanence is that I don't let permanence stop me from making decisions. I think that's where it frees me. I think thinking to myself that permanence should not be a component of my decision making. I think choice should be a component of my decision making. For example, when I was looking for work, um, you know, checking the classifieds, going to the career websites and checking Craigslist and things like that, I would see jobs that I may want. But when I would read the description, I would think, oh, God, I don't want to stay at this place. I know I would get sick of it. And so I wouldn't even apply. So I would start making excuses to not apply because I felt this sense of permanence that once I applied, I would be committed. Now that I know myself well enough, I know that I wasn't applying because I felt this permanence, but that permanence stemmed from my people-pleasing. And when I was in people-pleaser mode, uh, meaning I didn't want to let anyone down, so I would always try to please them in every way possible and say yes when I really meant no, Uh, When I was in that state of mind, then I never really honored myself. So when things got out of hand, like I talked about that job I didn't like and I didn't want to say anything about it because I didn't want to get in trouble or get fired, when things got out of hand in a relationship or a job or anything like that, I wouldn't say anything about it. I wouldn't honor myself. I wouldn't say, hey, you're disrespecting me. Or, hey, I feel bad when you say that. You're hurting my feelings. I wouldn't say any of that stuff. So everything became permanent because I never stood up for myself. Now that I'm in a different state of mind and can freely stand up for myself and honor myself easily, nothing has that dreaded sense of permanence anymore. Believe me, I would love permanence in some things in my life. I would love to know that everything's going to last indefinitely. But also knowing that it won't last indefinitely keeps me incentivized. It keeps me motivated to continue working at things. And it's a nice way to think about it, is to have, for example, a relationship that you know is not permanent, which means you need to work at it. You need to continue working at it and continue showing up, bringing the best version of yourself to that relationship as possible. The problem comes when Partners start taking advantage of the time they have together, thinking that it's permanent, thinking that, hey, now that I'm married or now that I'm committed, I don't have to do a single thing because I've already got what I want and everything is, it should now be uh, easier. And 
Sometimes it can get easier, but that's only if you have two healthy partners working at it together. But um, typically what happens is there's one partner that starts to take advantage of the time you have together and you think, I mean, that's not the problem, but uh, they think that, oh, they're always going to be here, so I don't really have to try hard. I mean, that happens. That happened with me. I don't really have to try hard, and I'm going to judge my wife uh, for her eating issues, and I'm going to judge her for this, and I'm going to say this or say that, and I don't care if she's upset because she's not going to leave me because we're committed. And that kind of thinking ruins relationships because you think it's permanent. You think they're not going to leave. You think it's too hard for them to leave, so they're just going to take it. And uh, that it's just destructive. It's destructive thinking. So what this all boils down to is I'm trying to convey that when it comes to making choices and believing you don't have a choice in certain situations or you feel like you're out of control and there's nothing you can do, I want you to stretch your mind beyond that and think about what would happen if you made the choice and don't set yourself in stone thinking that nothing can change because this is the way it is. I'm not trying to break up relationships or tell you to quit your job. I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying that sometimes we don't think beyond our own limiting thoughts because we don't stretch our imagination beyond what it could look like. A dysfunctional relationship could look like uh, two individuals going off on their own. You may not want that. You may, you may want something completely differently than that. You may want the relationship to heal itself or for you to heal or for them to heal. But what if it did look like that? What would happen? And then you put yourself in these imaginary scenarios and figure out where you'd be with it. It's not pleasant. A lot of the times it's not pleasant to go through this stuff. But what happens is you expand your choice. You free up your mind to be able to make choices that weren't necessarily there before. They were probably always there. You just chose not to visit that because it was unpleasant. It's the unpleasant choices we never visit. That's too unpleasant. I'm not going to, I'm not going to visit that choice. Well, I want you to (laughs) in your mind, just visit that choice. It's unpleasant. But what would I do if that was my only choice? If I had no other choice, but to take that choice, to make that decision, what would I do then? Oh, geez, I don't know. I, that's a tough call. I, I don't know what I would do. That, that would put me in a very tough position. Okay, but what would you do? What would you say? What would you think? How would you feel? Oh, that would be pretty awful. And I don't know. But then you think about it. What would you do? Okay, you're in your car or outside the house and you can't go back in the house. What would you do now? Geez, I don't know. I'd, uh, I guess I'd call my mom. I guess I'd call my brother. I guess I'd go to a hotel. I, I don't know. All these little thoughts start coming up that, that you wouldn't have had before. Just an interesting way to look at things and uh, stretch your mind a little bit and uh, maybe get you out of the feeling stuck without any option mode that you might be in in any area of your life. Hope this helps. We'll be right back. Ever since I started listening to podcasts way back in 2013 and also creating this podcast, The Overwhelmed Brain, my reading habits have changed entirely. I mean, I went from taking a book to the beach to loading up like tons of audiobooks on my smartphone and listening to them through headphones. And now it's so hard for me to pick up a physical book because of the time it takes away from so many other things that I want to get done. I don't seem to have the same time I used to. You ever feel like that? That's why I love audiobooks. Audiobooks are great for helping you be a better you, whether you want to feel healthier, get motivated, or learn something new. I remember I used to have to um, drive an hour to work back and forth. In the beginning, it felt so defeating. But one day, I got an audiobook. It was a Star Wars audiobook called Rogue Planet. It came on five CDs, and I listened to the whole thing twice over the next several weeks. It was a great story. Swapping out the CDs was kind of a hassle, but as you know, we don't have to worry about that anymore because we have Audible. You've heard of Audible. In fact, I just went on their site and searched for that book, and I found it. 
I forgot it was written by one of my favorite sci-fi authors, Greg Bear. That made me wonder if more of his books were on there. So, my search not only found a few other books, but dozens more of his books. Now I have a ton of stories to listen to, and I'm very excited to start. I want you to check out audible.com forward slash brain and see if they have your favorite author in there too. They have every genre imaginable. I mean, do you remember the old days when you uh, had to swap out cassettes? <laughs> now with Audible, all you need to do is log in and listen to your favorite books streamed across any of your devices. You can switch between each device picked up exactly where you left off. How cool is that? From your phone to your car to a tablet and even your Amazon Echo. Tons of books, hands and eyes free, while doing anything you want. Has your time taken on different priorities as mine has? I love listening to books, and I bet you do too, because you're listening to this podcast right now. I want you to start your 30-day trial by visiting audible.com forward slash brain. Or how about this? I mean, you can do this right away. Take your phone and text the word brain to 500-500. That'll start you on the trial right away. And then you can download your first book and start listening to it right away. This free trial offer is available exclusively through audible.com forward slash brain or texting the word brain to 500-500. Think about it. Self-help, sci-fi, fantasy, education, business, the classics, history, mysteries. They have it all. I want you to have it all too. Go to audible.com forward slash brain. That's A-U-D-I-B-L-E dot com forward slash brain. Or text the word brain, that's a lot easier, text the word brain to 500-500 and start listening today. Membership includes one free audiobook per month, exclusive sales, and 30% off all regularly priced audiobooks. And what you don't like, you can swap. You can't beat it. All right, welcome back. I have an interesting topic to talk about. It's uh, about um, sociopathy or antisocial personality disorder. I'm not going to talk about it in clinical terms because I'm not qualified to, but I am going to say this. Someone wrote to me asking me, how do you survive a sociopath in the workplace, one that you can't get away from? And why are sociopaths out to destroy others? That's a great question. Thank you. I'm going to call you Jen. Thank you, Jen, for um, asking that question. And uh, yeah, if you're in that situation, good luck. That's my advice. <laughs> I will say a little bit more, of course. But um, let me just go to the mayoclinic.org here and read you some of the symptoms of antisocial personality disorder, which are disregard for right and wrong, persistent lying or deceit to exploit others, uh, being callous, uh, cynical, and disrespectful of others, using charm or wit to manipulate others for personal gain or personal pleasure, uh, arrogance, a sense of superiority and being extremely opinionated, recurring problems with the law, including criminal behavior, repeatedly violating the rights of others through intimidation and dishonesty, impulsiveness or failure to plan ahead, uh, hostility, significant irritability, agitation, aggression or violence, lack of empathy, thats I should highlight that one, lack of empathy for others and lack of remorse, about harming others, unnecessary risk-taking or dangerous behavior with no regard for the safety of self or others, I'm almost done, poor or abusive relationships, failure to consider the negative consequences of behavior uh, or learn from that behavior, and uh, being consistently irresponsible and repeatedly failing to fulfill work or financial obligations. Now, you probably know someone that has one or more of these qualities, and Jen, the person at your workplace that you're dealing with uh, may have many of these symptoms, but maybe not all. I have met some people that fall high on the spectrum in uh, antisocial personality disorder. I fell through a hole in the floor once in front of someone who I believed has antisocial personality disorder, and he didn't seem to care at all. <laughs> he just said, hmm, or whatever he said. And this was his property. So he has this big hole in the floor. I fell through it, and he didn't seem to care. He didn't even reach over to help me up. He just saw me fall, and I think he just waited for me to get back up. 
when I got back up, I had this giant scrape on my leg. I was wearing shorts and uh, he just didn't care. <laughs> I've never been around someone who just didn't care and they didn't say, oh my God, are you all right? He just didn't uh, give any sign that uh, he felt bad for me. I'm not saying that he was all of these things because he seems to be a highly functional person. However, he is many of these things from what I know of him. Like uh, he didn't necessarily get into problems with the law, like criminal behavior, but he certainly has no problem defying authority and doing whatever he wanted. And I thought, that's interesting. This guy would make a great case study because uh, he just does whatever he wants and he doesn't care what anybody else thinks. And that is one of the biggest uh, symptoms or signs that you're dealing with someone who may possibly fall on the spectrum of antisocial personality dis disorder or even psychopathy, you know, psychopath. So um, again, I'm not here diagnosing. I'm not here to say I'm qualified to talk about this stuff. This is just an opinion. But uh, I do see from my own studies, from my own personal experience and history with some of these people, that uh, one of their biggest things is they just don't care about you. And I think that's important to understand and come to an acceptance with. And this is very hard to do for some people. Some people are in relationships with someone who just doesn't care. And I don't mean this is a fleeting like, oh, I'm sick of this relationship or I'm sick of you and I'm uh, getting to the point where I'm apathetic and I don't care. I mean, they just don't care. They will cheat and then you will feel bad and you will yell and scream and be upset and they just won't care. Now, what they might do is fake being sorry for what they did. I mean, let's just talk about it in a relationship way. They may uh, apologize and give you flowers, but really not change their behavior at all. So if it comes to like, cheating or betraying or lying or doing something that they know that you don't like or is unacceptable in social norms, in marriages, for example, then it won't phase them that they should do anything else. Because what they're doing, and I, I kind of talk about this in my How to Deal with Irrational People uh, ebook, what they're doing is trying to fulfill a need. It's just like this. Let's just say that um, you are hungry. You're, you want food, you're hungry, and you want to get to the uh, buffet table, but there's a long line. And you go, but I'm hungry. So what I'm going to do is just skip over all these people, go to the front of the line. Uh, I might even pay my way in because I don't want anyone to kick me out, but that's the only reason I'm going to pay my way in. And I'm going to get my food before anyone else. That's kind of the mentality these people have. They don't see that as wrong. That's an extreme example. You may not actually see that out in the real world, or well, you might, but uh, that's sort of what's going on there is that they just don't care. Now, what happens and why you don't see more of this type of behavior in more people, because I have a feeling it's more prevalent than we think, uh, is that uh, accountability sets in. The person who cuts in front of everyone in line is eventually going to get a punch in the face. <laughs> if not physically, then verbally or legally. Uh, the manager's going to see it and say, you can't do that, go, back, go to the end of the line. And uh, because they want to keep looking like the good guy, they might go, oh, of course, I, I didn't mean to. I accidentally uh, skipped this line thinking it was something else or whatever. They might have a tendency to do that as well is that they will make stuff up so that uh, they don't look like the bad guy and they'll just go back to their place in line and they may try it in other areas of life uh, and find out that accountability stops them from doing it. Not empathy, accountability. This is what I talk about in my mean workbook at uh, loveandabuse.com. Uh, the only way to stop someone who is, doesn't feel empathetic to your needs, to your pain, to your suffering is to create accountability in their life. Meaning, if they say, all right, hon, and again, we'll use relationships for example, all right, hon, uh, I promise I'll never do that again. And then they do it again, and you get upset again, and you think that you being upset is going to affect them and alter their behavior in some way. But for these kind of people, it doesn't. It doesn't do anything. That's why you're upset doesn't matter to them. 
But if they did that thing again and you left the relationship for a week, that might be enough accountability for them to go, hmm, she was serious. Or if they did that thing again and you broke their favorite um, toy model collection or whatever, you did something that, hey, if you do that again, I'm going to break your toy model collection and you do that, there would certainly be accountability. I'm not saying you should do any of this. I'm just saying that um, without accountability, they just don't get it. So if you're with someone, or in this case with Jen, if you work with someone who has antisocial personality disorder or some of the symptoms or any of the symptoms of psychopathy, uh, and you can find these symptoms online, you have to remember that the way you feel doesn't matter. Like I said, this is very hard, especially for empathetic and compassionate people and generous and kind people to understand because they assume everyone feels that way. Everyone's going to feel bad for someone suffering, and it's just not true. Not everyone feels bad. Not everyone feels empathetic. And people like this, really, it seems like they have no empathy. They just don't care. It's sort of like uh, some of the road rage videos I've seen online. These are good to watch to know what not to do. (laughs) So if you ever feel like watching something like that, you can. There are a lot of negative energy in there. But uh, I watch to watch human behavior and how people respond and react. And uh, what happens is some people will do something, like they'll cut someone off, and then they'll chase each other through traffic. It's really ridiculous and dangerous. And then finally, the, the person who got cut off catches up with them and they follow them to a parking lot and then the person who got cut off storms up to the person who cut them off and the person who cut them off is like I don't care I don't care and as the person who got cut off is like why did you cut me off you are so dangerous you put my family's life in danger and the driver's like I don't care I don't care now that's a defense measure to try to squash the aggressor And it can work because if somebody just says to you over and over again, I don't care, I don't care, the aggressor eventually feels so frustrated and uh, there's nothing they can do. And they usually get madder because they want the other person to react. They want the other person to feel bad for what they did. But it may never come to that with someone like that. In that case, that may not be antisocial personality. That just may be uh, a defense mechanism that kicks in so that the other person can avoid blame, can avoid Uh, getting in trouble, is committed to being right even though if they're wrong. There's all kinds of things that could go on there. And that's a special circumstance. But that particular uh, response, I don't care, I don't care, uh, is a way a person with antisocial personality disorder might uh, feel all the time where they just don't care. And if someone doesn't care, you can't get through to them through your emotions. You can't say, don't you feel bad for what you did? You can't say that. It doesn't work. You can't say, do you realize you're hurting me? I mean, you can say it, but it's not going to work. It's not going to be a way to get through to them. The only way to get through to them is to say, if you do that again, I will do something to hold you accountable. Not those words, but you say, you know, fill in the blank. If you take my stapler from my desk again, I will take your computer. (laughs) <laughs> these are extreme examples you know if I was in this situation and uh, I was at work and I was working with somebody like this I might say something like if you take my stapler again let's just say they take my stapler all the time I will remove something from your desk until you understand that there are consequences for you doing this again you may not say it in those particular words I can picture myself in a work situation being a little bit more frustrated, (laughs) a little bit more energized. Like, if you take that stapler off my desk again, I'm going to whatever. And that way, when the accountability hits them, they go, huh, so something of mine gets taken away. I don't want that to happen, so I guess I'll stop taking a stapler. And that might be the only way they learn. So if this person's a superior at your workplace, a manager or something like that, uh, there may be nothing you can do Because they're not going to care if they fire you. They're not going to care if you quit. It just doesn't matter to them. All that matters is that they're getting their own needs met. And as long as those needs continue to be met, regardless of who helps them meet it, 
They may not even be thankful for you helping them meet those needs. I don't know. But anyone at your workplace, I always recommend showing up, honoring yourself. Now, this is not popular advice because you might have a superior that uh, if you honor yourself with them, they fire you immediately. But I have no problem doing that. I have no problem showing up to my superior and say, hey, look, you're disrespecting me by doing this. That hasn't come back to bite me. In fact, it's only rewarded me every time I've done something like that. But at the same time, I won't accept bad behavior. If someone is doing bad behavior, even if I'm reliant on the job or the, the relationship that I have with them, I will still call them out because I have more respect for myself. I have compassion for myself. I don't want to be mistreated. And if they're going to choose to continue to mistreat me, I will call them out on it. If they don't care, then I may make them accountable in some way. If that accountability isn't strong enough and they continue to show up in a way that's unhealthy for me, then I leave. I get out of that situation because there are some people that cannot be reasoned with and especially emotionally reasoned with when they have no empathy, they don't care. Whatever happens to you is off their radar. They don't care. Whatever they do to you, however they make you feel, doesn't register. It doesn't mean that they are doing it intentionally. Typically, this type of person has needs that supersede anything else going on in their life, supersede your life, supersede uh, circumstances. This type of person might park in a handicapped spot when they're not handicapped because their needs are more important. They'll pull up. They, they're only going to be a minute. They'll run in and get something and then come back out because their needs are more important. Again, just because somebody has one or more, more symptoms of uh, sociopathy or antisocial personality disorder doesn't mean they're a sociopath, doesn't mean they're a psychopath. I mean, a lot of us can fall under any of these categories. How often have any of us gone over the speed limit while driving? That's a disregard for the law. It truly is. So that is in us. And I know someone's listening right now saying, I never do that. <laughs> but it is in most of us to go, well, that's just a suggestion. We'll make up uh, excuses that justify us speeding. Well, I had to get there faster. Well, I was in an emergency. Well, this, well, that. There's all these justifications to make what we're doing right. Imagine if that we felt like that with everything in our life. That's what I'm talking about. There are people like that that feel that way with everything in their life. Sort of like my um, girlfriend's ex. He felt fully justified in cheating. Fully justified. She had never cheated on him. Uh, maybe their sex life wasn't the best. I don't know. Maybe she didn't like the way he emotionally abused her. And so he felt like he had to have sex with other people. I don't know. Um, but that's what happened is that he didn't care about how she felt about him fulfilling his needs, wants, and desires. He did whatever he wanted. And then when he was caught and he promised he would never do it again, he didn't change a thing. So he showed no empathy, no remorse. He pretended to be remorseful. He said sorry. He said all the things that uh, some sociopathological people might say because they're, they put on the charm. They want to gain agreeance and gain rapport because that'll give them an entryway to manipulate you. He did all of that. And she fell for it. And then, of course, his behavior never stopped. So the quick answer to your question, Jen, is that you can survive a sociopath in the workplace uh, by providing accountability. And that may be the only way to do it unless you develop an, an I don't care attitude about that person. If you say, I don't care what that person does uh, as long as they're not doing it to me. I mean, you do have to show up honoring yourself, being compassionate towards yourself, protecting yourself, because if he's doing anything that is violating your boundaries, violating your uh, values, then you have every right to stand up and say, no, I won't accept that in my life. And if this person says, I don't care, uh, whatever, or here's another one that, um, again, I talk about in my uh, mean workbook, you're just too sensitive. Oh, I was just joking. Or you're overreacting. They love to turn you against yourself. Sociopaths are great at that. They turn 
your own beliefs, your own thoughts, your own words against yourself so that instead of making them the bad guy, they make you your own bad guy. Hard to explain, but that's what happens is that they will guilt you because they will use your own kindness against you. They will take advantage of your naivete and make you feel bad for being honest, for being thoughtful, for being uh, empathetic. They'll make you feel bad for approaching them honestly with integrity and trying to resolve the problem. They'll make you think that you are the problem. So you may not be able to survive in a workplace with someone like that, but definitely honor yourself, provide accountability. And uh, your second question on why are sociopaths out to destroy others? I think it's because you're in the way. I think that's what all it is, is that these people have a need, whether it's money, whether it's sex, whether it's whatever desires they have. And if you're in the way of that need, they will roll you over. They may not do it physically, but they'll do it in a way that you get out of the way so that they can get their needs met. But I don't think they intentionally care about destroying you. You're just in the way of their goals. And so when you have someone like that, you can't, you can't reason logically or emotionally. You just have to know who they are and understand their personality. Understand that they're not going to change, nor do they care. Hope this helps you. Sorry you have to deal with this. Great topic. Thanks for bringing it up. We'll be right back. Thank you for listening to another episode of The Overwhelmed Brain. I want to thank Audible. I want you to go to audible.com. That's A U D I B L E. Dot com and make sure to add forward slash brain so you get your 30-day free trial. And you can also text the word brain to 500-500 to make it easier to start it. And I want to thank iTunes reviewer. Uh, let's see, how do I say this? F, is it I or L? FLNP123, who says, the best show ever. <laughs> Down to earth logical solutions for anxiety and self-worth. Makes me feel like I'm not alone helping me so much. Thank you so much for that review. I appreciate you taking the time to do that. And you are not alone. You are definitely not alone. There are thousands that listen to this show and there are millions more that uh, feel what you're feeling. And I'm just glad that you found what you need to help you out. I appreciate you. Thank you for your review. And thank you to the patron members. If you go to patron.theoverwhelmedbrain.com, that's a way to support the show. There are a couple levels to join. You can get uh, episodes and workbooks in one level, and you can get uh, email coaching and everything else in, at the other level. And a few people taking advantage of that and really getting what they need from it. And I'm enjoying connecting with them through that program. So if you're interested in any of that and you're getting value from this show and you want to show your support, go to patron.theoverwhelmedbrain.com. And thank you to existing patron members. I appreciate you. And I want you to consider going to loveandabuse.com. You know, we had that segment on sociopathological people and sociopathological. Well, it's antisocial personality disorder. I don't really talk about that in the mean workbook, but I do talk about emotional abuse and manipulation, which is definitely along the same lines, uh, the same signs and symptoms and the mean workbook at loveandabuse.com is the best way to assess if your relationship is being plagued with emotional abuse or manipulation. I mean, you may already know it is, but you might be in a relationship where it's just foggy. You can't really articulate what's going on. Uh, it's difficult and it shouldn't be. It's complex and it shouldn't be. Or you always feel like you're always wrong or your partner always makes you feel guilty or always shows you how you're being oversensitive or you just don't understand or you're making the wrong choices and here's why. If you always feel like you're on that side of every conversation or argument, you might be being manipulated. So take the mean test. It's a 200 point checklist along with an evaluation and steps on how to heal, recover, or even leave the relationship if that's your choice. There's all kinds of good resources in there and uh, several audio interviews, including one with my girlfriend who had survived many years with an emotional abuser. 
It's been a very helpful guy to get feedback on it all the time. And I want you to know exactly what's happening in your relationship. Get the mean workbook at loveandabuse.com. And finally, I want to thank Kevin McLeod of Incompetech.com for some of the music transitions in the overwhelmed brain. And to close the show, I'm sure you've heard of the term codependence. Codependence is, uh, I, I defined this about three years ago. I mean, I, don't, I didn't define it, but I, I came up with my own definition for it, which is when two or more people fulfill a need for each other that strengthens a dysfunction between them. I think that's a good way to look at it. If you have a codependent relationship, what that means is that you depend on your partner to fulfill a need in you, usually a dysfunctional need, and they depend on you to fulfill a need in them. Again, usually a dysfunctional need. A good example of a codependent relationship is uh, my mom. My mom was in a 40 plus year relationship with an abusive alcoholic. And every time he passed out or ran out of money or ran into some other difficulty in his life, she would be there to pick up the pieces in some way, shape or form. For example, she told me one day in the winter, he went out into the snow in his bathrobe and he was so intoxicated that he fell in the snow and he couldn't get up. His bathrobe, I think it might have fallen off or something or it just spread open. So he's pretty much naked in the snow. When what she did was pick him up, uh, help him get back in the house and get him warm. Now, that sounds like something that you would do for someone that you love, right? That sounds like something that anyone would do. However, multiply that by a thousand, where every time he got drunk, he fell, he did something, he broke glass, he kicked holes in the wall, that she would come along behind him and clean up after him, clean up the glass, call the um, dryer wall repair guy to fix the walls, she would find ways to fix what he would break. Not just physical stuff, just anything that went wrong, she would be there to help him get through it. The problem with that is that he never learns, and we were just talking about accountability, he never learns what happens when no one's there to clean up after him. He never develops healthy, productive behavior for himself Because someone's always there to clean up after him. Someone's always there to pick up the mess. So that relationship lasted as long as it did, even though she didn't want it to last. But she was always there making sure he was taken care of. I talked to my mom, and several of us had talked to my mom over the years, saying, why don't you just leave him? We'll give you a place to stay. But she feared leaving, and she was also codependent. Codependent in a way that she wanted to be the people pleaser because she believed that the more she tried to help him, uh, the more likely he would change and become the husband that she wanted. So this codependent uh, relationship lasted for years and years and years because she relied on something that was just a fantasy. She hoped that he would change, but of course he never changed. And her dysfunction of people pleasing was getting fulfilled with someone that she always had to help. Her dysfunction of people-pleasing and rescuing was getting fulfilled because now she had someone to rescue consistently. But in any codependent relationship, there's almost always a giver and a taker. The giver, the people-pleaser, the rescuer, whoever, is giving and giving and giving and never getting the reciprocation. And the taker loves the position they're in because they're getting everything they need and someone's cleaning up after them. So the taker never gets tired of being in that position. So the taker usually gets worse and the giver usually gets burnt out. The codependent relationship can start off strong because the people pleaser is getting their needs met and the victim or the addict or abuser is getting their needs met. But as soon as the giver starts to get drained and realize there's no reciprocation, then the giver wants out. And now there's no way out because the codependence has started and the repetitive cycle continues. That cycle is the taker falls down, the giver picks back up. The taker falls down, the giver picks back up. Instead of the giver just standing up and going, you know what, the next time you fall, you're getting yourself up. But then that guilt comes in because they're overly empathetic, overly compassionate for someone else instead of themselves. And they'll step up and go, all right, I'll pick you up. 
All right, I'll clean up the glass because I don't want to step in it. They'll start justifying it. All right, I'll clean up your, excuse me, vomit uh, because it smells and you won't be able to clean it up until tomorrow because that's when you wake up. You know, all these little things that happen that continue the codependence and they never end. That's why codependence is very unhealthy is that the giver keeps giving, the taker keeps taking. It's a very one-sided relationship. And soon, there's a lot of hatred from one side. And the other side may have no problem at all. They love being in the relationship because they're getting their every need met. just doesn't work. So this is based on an article I wrote back in 2014 at theoverwhelmedbrain.com. Just look for uh, codependence in the search field and you'll see it. And I wanted to talk about that because a couple people have mentioned it. There's an email that I might read on the show next week uh, regarding that. And I also received an email recently saying that this person found that article and was very grateful that he found it. And he said it would change his life. So I wanted to mention it here to make sure that you knew about it just in case it helps you too. And no matter what kind of relationship you're in, I always want you to follow the path that uh, empowers you the most. How do you do that? You open your mind. This will help you step into a place where you can make powerful, firm decisions and take action so that you can create the life you want. Always take steps to grow and evolve. You are powerful beyond measure. And above all, and this is something I absolutely know to be true about you, you are amazing. Amazing.